It's now time for members' statements. Again, I recognize the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Saturday afternoon, I hosted an emergency community meeting on changes to autism program. I was amazed that this diverse group of people, reflective of my riding of York Southwestern, were able to talk, listen, and hear each other. In that room, there was a, such a strong sense of caring, respect, and understanding with, with that group of strangers. The common denominator was that they have a child or care for a child with autism. I learned so much in those two hours. I heard that these parents are fearful, scared, that this new system is setting, is setting their children up for failure. I heard that one size will not fit all. The children's needs are unique, that an iPad is a tool, not a treatment, mm -hmm. that the families are profoundly disappointed with the so-called consultations. I listened as these parents wrestled with questions. Where is the evidence? Where is the transparency? Why is one child worth more than another? Mm -hmm. How will their family survive with this diluted service? These families need adequate funding, support, services, and restive care. I hear the support, the experience in the room shared. One woman cautioned that if services aren't provided now, then the government will certainly be paying later. Mm. Parents with older, now adult children, warn those with young ones to get all the services you can, so, you, so your child will develop to their fullest potential. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Oakville. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, since I was elected in June of last year, I've been very fortunate to attend a number of events across Oakville and throughout the province. Thank you. Oakville is proud to be home with the 540 Golden Hawks Royal C Canadian Air Cadet Squadron, the largest air cadet squadron in the province. And I'm pleased that I have been able to meet with the cadets and the officers of the squadron. Cadet units play an important role in our communities, such as on Remembrance Day when they march in local parades to help commemorate the service of our past and present men and women of our armed forces defending our country. As a former cadet myself, I can state that the cadets learn valuable lessons in teamwork, develop leadership skills, and challenge themselves further in personal growth. Cadets support the fundraising efforts of the annual Poppy Drives in the lead up to Remembrance Day, which support the Royal Canadian Legion and veterans and a number of other community activities. The skills they learn and the experiences they encounter help them for their futures. They build solid bedrock, bedrock from which to grow and be community-minded members of our society to help others. This week, the 540 Golden Hawk Squadron will be hosting their annual mess dinner. Mess dinners are a wonderful opportunity for the community to interact with the cadets, allow these young people to share a meal with their friends and family, and celebrate their accomplishments over the year. Oakville is proud to be home of the 540 Golden Hawks, and I look forward to sharing in their celebrations this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Windsor, to come see. Speaker, I wish to pay tribute today to Albert Jackson. He was born a slave in the United States. Before he was two years old, his widowed mother bundled up her seven, seven children and lit out for Canada. They had help on the Underground Railroad and got here in 1858. In 1882, Albert Jackson became Canada's first black letter carrier. But his white colleagues wouldn't work with him, so management, management made him a hall porter. Toronto's black community protested. Albert was described in the media as an obnoxious colored man and as the objectionable African. Those headlines caught the attention of Sir John A. Macdonald, who was running for re-election, and two days later, Albert was reinstated as a letter carrier. Albert Jackson delivered mail in Toronto for 36 years. He died in 1918. Last spring, he was honored by the Canadian Union of Postal Workers with a commemorative poster a roadway in Toronto has been renamed Albert Jackson Lane, and this month there's a new Canadian stamp featuring Albert in his postal uniform, Canada's first black letter carrier. Speaker, Albert Jackson's great-granddaughter lives in Windsor. Christine Jackson is a nurse who says Albert went on to become a respected landowner and a patriarch to a successful family. It's fitting, I believe, in this Black History Month to remember 
Albert Jackson, and it's a shame it's taken this long to do so. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Saturday, I was at the celebration for the uh, Black History Month from the Francophone Center, and the team of uh, the executive director and the whole team organized a, an event that was very positive. It was at the exhibition place, and I can confirm there was more than 500 people they danced, they sang, and it was excellent as entertainment and as an event. And I would like to say that the month, Black History Month, is the occasion to pay tribute to the uh, black men and women that helped and shaped our province and country. It's important to remember the, what the black community brought to the cultural diversity of the Francophone family. This diversity is our strength and allows us to have a better, a more richer society in Ontario and open on the world. I was had a lot of chance to be uh, seated with Mr. René Sivo, Jean-Luc Bernard, Fl uh, Madame Florence, the executive director, Mr. Mike Troyet, uh, he is the Consul General of France in Toronto, and uh, Madame, uh, Madame, uh, Madame uh, Marie Lévy Hulse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Participation House as they recently celebrated their 30th anniversary of creating an inclusive community. Participation House provides meaningful support services, recreation, and engaging activities for people living with disabilities, and their Project Hope gives support to medically fragile and high-needs individuals. We celebrate the movement away from the asylum model, but there aren't enough spaces in the community for people living with disabilities. Their care providers, their parents, are often pushed to the limit and only receive residential placements if the family is on the brink of collapse and or tragedy. Medically fragile individuals end up in hospital when their family can no longer provide care, and a year in hospital can cost more than a million dollars. As my friend from Windsor West noted in her private member's bill, Noah and Gregory's Law, wait lists for supportive housing can be 22 to 24 years long and sometimes even longer. During my tour with Participation House CEO Brian Dunn, I was shocked to see an industrial-sized fire sprinkler system in a modest four-person bungalow, the exact same requirement for a multi-story nursing home. This regulation is completely overboard and an unrealistic barrier prohibiting fantastic groups like Participation House from creating new dwellings for individuals living with disabilities. To the members opposite, cut this red tape and help fantastic organizations like Participation House. I want to thank Participation House for all they do and thank the great residents of London for supporting Participation House. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Myself also want to celebrate the history, Black History Month in Canada and in Ontario, and particularly in the riding that I represent, Ottawa, Vanier. This house during Black History Month to speak about and celebrate the incredible contribution of the Black community that uh, the Black community has made in the writing of Ottawa Vanier and across Ontario. The Black community contributes very much in all sectors of the economy. The Black community has made a vibrant contribution to our civic, our cultural, our professional communities in Ontario and often in the face of structural discrimination and adversity. Several black trailblazers who have left inspiring legacies need to be celebrated, and that's what we're doing this month. We don't have to uh, need to look elsewhere other than Ottawa to see the contribution given by the black community. The last John G. Dennison Prize 
uh, uh, John G. Dassin was uh, a man that worked for 26 years to celebrate multiculturalism in Canada. Finally, we, there is a prize in his name. It's the last peer person who received a young woman who works exactly to celebrate the diaspora, black diaspora in Ottawa. I'll say briefly that I had the privilege of going to the Global Community Awards last Saturday night. Young high school students were celebrated for all the things they had done for their community. They have made history, they will continue to make history, and we salute them today. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, February is Black History Month. That is why we have this time from a lot of us to celebrate and to recognize the important contributions that Black Canadians have made to Canadian society. Know the past, shape the future is the theme of this year's celebration organized by the York Regional Police. Every year, I joined the York Regional Police to kick off the Black History Month in York Region. In fact, this is the first event I attended when I first served as the board member in York Regional Police 13 years ago. I am very impressed with the inclusiveness promoted in York Region and Ontario. We respect and celebrate the success and contributions of every diverse community. This is what making Ontario and Canada so vibrant. We get to learn and appreciate each other's culture, recognize their strength and accomplishments. What an encouragement to know that York Region is committed to creating a community that is welcoming and inclusive and recognize and celebrate all dimensions of diversity. Last night, Minister Tibolo and Minister Phillips led us to welcome and celebrate Black History Month right at Queen's Park as well. We enjoy their success, their programs, their food, and most importantly, their company. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. It's always a great pleasure to meet with my wonderful constituents of Parkdale High Park who are involved in many different initiatives and programs that serve our community, especially the most vulnerable. One such person is Nancy Gale, who I met with a few weeks ago and shared with me information about a program that she's involved in, the Primary Care Low Back Pain Program. As we look into how we can improve our healthcare system in Ontario, we must preserve programs that provide dignity and equal access to our public health care options. We must speak for all people. We know that multidisciplinary health care teams make a difference, and programs available to patients without the financial means to access such care are, in, are essential. The Primary Care Low Back Pain Program is one such example that ensures equal access to people with fewer resources, fewer options, and fewer supports. Take for instance Lisa Morris. She was suffering from arthritis and the effects of physical and emotional abuse. Lisa had no options and relied on her opioid prescription to medicate her chronic pain away. Through the Primary Care Low Back Pain Program, Lisa eliminated opioids and all pain medications, and she's working. This program adds no physical infrastructure or administrative overhead. All costs are specialized healthcare professionals to deliver direct patient care. As you know, equal access to healthcare is a fundamental right of every Ontarian. Let us remember that there are people, vulnerable people, impacted by changes to our healthcare system. Let us keep what works for them. Thank you. Member statements. The member from Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this past Saturday, I was pleased to join the Milton Historical Society at a ceremony where eight outstanding individuals were inducted into the Milton Walk of Fame. Kayla Alexander was recognized for her achievement in professional basketball in the WNBA. Matthew O'Meara was recognized for playing in the CFL as an offensive lineman. Scott Hogarth was recognized for his 11-time martial arts world champion title and for being part of 10 international action movies. Matthew Sewell was inducted for his many athletic accomplishments, with the, including the CFL playing for Toronto Argonauts, Mr. Speaker. Bert Wasman was recognized for being a driving force behind the success of Hat Limited. Late Arthur Henry Fleming was inducted for his contribution at the Thrope 
Polytechnic Institute, late Dr. George Sherwood, whom was inducted for his many accolades as one of Canada's leading geologists. Late Oscar Ernest Fleming was inducted for his achievements in law, business, the hydroelectric system in Ontario, and was instrumental in building of the St. Lawrence Seaway. These members, along with all of the other members of the Milton Walk of Fame, uh, make Milton and Canada very proud, Mr. Speaker. I would like to again congratulate each and every member, their families and friends, for this wonderful recognition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Kitchener Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is a pleasure today to rise and speak a little bit about the Canadian International Auto Show that rolled into town last week, running from February 14th to February 23rd. From Formula One exhibits to Metro Lake Go buses, there was a little something for everyone at the auto show. Personally, I took the opportunity to visit the Toyota exhibit. Toyota is a big producer and distributor of automobiles in Waterloo Region as well as the World War II era vehicles display, reflecting on the fact that this year marks the 75th anniversary of D-Day. I also had the opportunity to participate in some associated uh, media opportunities while at the auto show. There were, these were great opportunities to deliver the pro-auto message being advanced by our government. Over the course of three interviews with the Greg Carrasco Show, the Tim Hudak Show, and Norris MacDonald at the auto show's live stage, I highlighted the ongoing and recent measures of our government to enhance the competitiveness of Ontario's automotive industry. Uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker. Under the previous government, we saw a, uh, an increase in automotive capital fleeing Canada in favour for greener pastures to the oh, south. Oh, no, it's not happening now. No, no, we'll make sure that it keeps it. And our government has made a whopping commitment of to cut red tape by 25%. Uh, by 2020, Mr. Speaker. Auto manufacturers and auto dealers do so much for this province and our economy. It was a pleasure to attend this year's Canadian International Auto Show. Thank you very much. That concludes our time for reports by, com or by for member statements, I should say. Next, we have reports by committees.